and I'm going to just move along and, and plug our council. So in accordance with the 1993 Family Support Act, the New Jersey Council on Developmental Disabilities established the Regional Family Support Planning Councils. And our councils provide a venue for parents and family members of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to exchange knowledge and information about family support services. And our members advocate for, um, for their family's needs. And we also collaborate with the Division of Children and Families and the Division of Developmental Disabilities and the, uh, and all our members are volunteers and are committed to the, you know, creating the best possible lives for our children. So again, I'd like to welcome everybody. And just, I, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce Paul Aronson, who's currently serving as New Jersey statewide ombudsman for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. He was appointed by Governor Phil Murphy in April 2018, and he serves as the administrator's lead advocate and ally for New Jersey residents in need of critical services and supports ranging from early childhood through adulthood. Paul was recently appointed to, by President Biden to serve on the President's Committee for People with Intellectual Disabilities, which serves as the federal advisor to the President and the US Secretary of Health and Human Services. And previously, Paul held several positions in both public and private sectors. And um, he served as a member of the, Human <clears throat> and of the Human and Children's Services Committee for Governor-elect Murphy's transition team. Paul's understanding and passion for disabilities issues is rooted in family, his family experience, specifically learned so much from his siblings, including his sister, Patty, who lived her life with disabilities as well as with enormous strength, courage, grace, and beauty. He also learned so much from their mother, Margot, who was his sister's primary caregiver. So I'd like to introduce Paul. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning to those of you in the room. Good morning to those of you not in the room, but in your own living rooms. Uh, it's great to be here with you today. Uh, what I thought I would do is uh, just start with a quick overview of our office, who we are, what we are, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with us. Talk to you a little bit about our annual report at a very high level, uh, because we just submitted our annual report to the governor uh, and the legislature this week and uh, then open it up for some questions and uh, conversation. Uh, I know we've got a full schedule. A couple of my colleagues are gonna be joining later, uh, Jonathan Siegfried and Molly Green. So I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for their presentations and their Q and A. So our office, uh, as many of you know, uh, and yes, that is a telephone. It sounds like it's 1980s telephone. Uh, <laughs> uh, our office was created about four and a half years ago by the state legislature in December of 2017. It was signed into law by Governor uh, Christie in January of 2018, and I was appointed by Governor Murphy in April 2018. So just we've been operational for about four years now. And it's an office that was, that was born out of the recognition that while here in New Jersey, there are a lot of supports and services for children and adults uh, with intellectual developmental disabilities. There was, was a recognition that there's also a lot of families, a lot of individuals that throw, fall through the gaps, uh, that don't get the services and supports they need and deserve. And so what the legislature did with, and the governor is they created this office and our job really is to be a resource, to be a resource for individuals of all ages and, and their family members. Uh, the legislation that created the office uh, has, you know, different responsibilities assigned to it. Uh, but we've sort of thrown into three buckets. One is uh, really just, again, serving as a resource for individuals and families, uh, trying to connect them to the offices, to the people, whatever it is that they need to be connected to, again, to make sure that they get the supports and services that they need and deserve. Uh, often that means that we're troubleshooting. We're sort of, people come to us uh, when there's a question, when there's a problem, and we try to sort of help them sort of find their way through it. Uh, second, we work very closely with individuals and families 
to try to help improve the system of care for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Sometimes it's a small issue, very particular, sometimes it's a larger issue, but because of the, our office serves sort of as a nexus between individuals and families on the one hand and decision makers on the other, we try to use that, that, that sort of that perspective, that, that, that position to really try to sort of move the ball forward, try to make the improvements, make the system more accessible, more user-friendly. And third, and overarching, uh, we really try to help make sure that the voices of individuals and the voices of families are heard in a, in a meaningful way, not just on the issues that directly impact them, uh, but also again, in the larger policy discussions. Uh, our office is what they say, in but not of the treasury department. Uh, and that was done intentionally to give the, the office a little, some, some independence. Uh, but what it also does and what it recognizes is that the issues that affect people with disabilities, like the issues that affect everyone, don't just reside in one department. And so by putting us in but not of the treasury department, it's given us system-wide perspective. And so the issues we can work on, not just on human services and children and families, but education, health, public safety, transportation, you name it, we, we, we have that system-wide perspective and we can help individuals and families sort of depend, regardless of what their needs are. Uh, we actually have a physical office. It's in the Department of Community Affairs. Uh, that was a random decision by somebody because I guess there was some extra office space. Uh, but it's great because now we're, we're actually located uh, with the, the long-term care ombudsman and we're able to share resources. But since the beginning, uh, except for sort of some time during COVID, but since the beginning, we have really tried to take the, the office on the road, if you will. And as many of you know, we try to meet with you in your, in your homes, in your Starbucks, in your diners, you know, we visit schools, we, we visit workplaces. We really try to get out and about. Um, and we do that for, for two reasons. One is we wanna make it easier on the individual and the family so they don't have to come to Trenton or we, you know, we don't have to just do things by phone. But second, and really importantly, it gives us a, a somewhat unique perspective uh, as, as government officials, because we get to visit with families, again, in their living rooms, at their, in their kitchens, you know, and really see, feel, and hear this, the family situation up close and personal. We, we get to know the individual, we get to know the family, we get to sort of see the surroundings, and it really helps us not only to help them in that particular situation, but it helps us also to convey that family situation that individual situation to our colleagues in the different departments. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've really tried to keep it really sort of personal the way we, we sort of approach our work. Uh, and again, re recognizing that we have that unique perspective as in that nexus between the individuals and families and, and decision makers and policy makers and others. Uh, there's three of us in our office. We're, we're a small but busy operation. Uh, there's myself, uh, there's Christine Bacter, who is actually here in the live audience with us today. Uh, and our latest addition is CJ Dodge, who joined us uh, in March. Uh, each one of us has, brings to the, our work, you know, uh, a mix of both professional and personal experience with disability. We also, all three of us have very important, but very different personal lived experience with disability. And that's really important because it really allows us to sort of connect more closely with the individuals and the families we serve and to do so in an in a, in a, in a even more meaningful way. Um, and so we, we really were excited about that. Uh, so one of the things we have to do in, in, the, uh, in our jobs is uh, we have to do an annual report that goes to the governor, goes to the legislature, goes to the commissioners of human services and the Department of Children and Families. Uh, Guidance in the legislation that created the office for that report, it's kind of general. It says, you know, you're supposed to talk, you know, give a summary of the preceding year's uh, work and, you know, make some recommendations. But since the beginning, we really tried to use it as, as an opportunity sort of to tell the story, uh, the story that we hear day in and day out from individuals and families. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the report, like the work we do is, is very personal and, and very emotional. And in fact, the emotion is a really important piece of it. Uh, in, in the, so in this year's report, uh, you know, in, the, in the preface, you know, we, we talk about that emotion. Uh, and we chose to do that because it, it's so central to the work we do. And it's, so, and it's like a theme throughout the report for those of you who had the opportunity to read all 30 pages uh, in, the, in the last couple of days. But we, we speak to the emotional component. Um, 
And you know, one of the things we, we, we point out there is you know, we get so emotionally invested in, in, the, in the work that we do, uh, which I think is a good thing. I think it's an important thing. It needs to have its balance and stuff like that because you know, we find ourselves, and Christine, I'm sure will completely agree with this, you know, we, we find ourselves, you know, wanting to, you know, you know, somebody comes to us angry or sad, we, we share those emotions. We want to yell with them. We want to cry with them. Uh, we, we, we feel it. Uh, and we do that not just because we are family members ourselves and we have that personal connection, but because we're getting it unfiltered from the individuals and families. We have ongoing conversations. We're on the phone all day. We're on email all day. Now we're on video meetings all day. Uh, and when we can, we're in their living rooms. And so we, 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 we get emotionally invested. And so one of the things we put in the, in the preface is, you know, we, we thank our, the folks we work with in and out of government for their partnership, but we also thank them for their understanding when we disagree, because that happens. Uh, and we do get emotionally invested. And so I, I underscore that point because it is so central to our work and it's very central to the report that we put out a few days ago. Uh, this is our fourth annual report. Uh, the First two, you know, we sort of broke it up into making observations, systemic observations, as well as issue specific observations. In fact, the second report was like 45 pages and it had, it was like a laundry list of issues. And even that list wasn't in an exhaustive list, uh, but there's so many things that, that are brought to our attention. And that's what we want to use. We tried to use that report to talk about. Uh, systemically, you know, one of the things we always start off the reports with is talking about the complexity of the system of care. Uh, and we talk about how, you know, really our system of care here in New Jersey is a, is, a, is a tale of two systems, one good and one not good enough. Uh, and by that, what I mean is, you know, we know, and those of us probably, and everybody in this meeting knows, we've got some really good people working in our system of care in government, uh, including some of my colleagues who we'll be talking to later, but also outside, you know, in the larger disability community, there's really good people that have dedicated their lives to serving others. And that is extraordinary. And we also here in New Jersey have a lot of resources, which is a good thing for children as well as adults. But the not so good is that a lot of folks, a lot of folks fall through the cracks. And these are the people that, that Christine, CJ and I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, again, people come to us, not when things are going well, they come to us when things are not going well or when they can't find their resources they need, as it should be. But I gotta tell you, it's, 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 it's amazing the number and the complexity of, of the situations that are brought to our attention. Um, and actually the way we've sort of grown the office over its short lifespan uh, and the way it's just evolved, uh, people come to us more often than not when they're in crisis. Uh, and so we've, we've spent a lot of our time really trying to troubleshoot, listen, work with families. Uh, and so while we have a lot of people that just come to us for one issue, maybe here or there, uh, we have some families that we've been working with ongoing. Uh, and we really, we get invested in that. So the first two reports were set up with systemic and specific observations. Last year, we took more of a thematic approach. Uh, we took a deep dive, obviously, on how the state responded on, to COVID and the whole pandemic. Uh, we looked at some other issues, including the way families are treated in, in, in the system. And I could speak at length about that one, but I find it very disheartening. Often the families are so often dismissed, disregarded, just disrespected, it seems, uh, which I think is not only unfair to them, but it's a real missed opportunity because no one knows the individuals uh, better than, than their family members. Uh, and again, I can speak from personal experiences. As Eileen noted, you know, I come from family disability. I, I saw my mom, you know, she, you know, she was my sister's biggest champion. Uh, I didn't always agree with every decision she made, but there's no question she made it, you know, completely, you know, from her heart and with the best of intentions. We need to do a better job sort of engaging families, giving them a seat at the table, making them part of part of the, the process going forward. But that was last year's report. So this year's report, what we decided to do is two things. One is sort of take a deeper dive on sort of the systemic. Why are there systemic problems, uh, challenges that families and individuals face? And then we took a deep dive on sort of the eight issues that come to our attention more often than not last year, uh, some of them on a, on a daily basis. Uh, again, as we point out, this is not to say other issues aren't important. So all the issues are important, but these are the, you know, rather than sort of cataloging all the issues every year, we figured let's, let's focus on the eight that come to our attention every year. Now, going back to the systemic, you know, the, what we talk about at great length is, you know, why are there systemic problems? Why are there systemic challenges? Why is it so complex? Why does it seem, the system seem so inflexible? Why doesn't everybody in the system have that same sense of urgency 
that we as family members have. And what we talk about is, is the disconnect that seems to exist between the decision makers and those that are affected by the decisions. Now, I'm not gonna spend too much, I could go on about this, and I've thought about this a great deal, again, as a family member, uh, and as somebody who's been in and out of government for most of my professional life, you know, why do seemingly well-intentioned good people make bad decisions? Why do they sometimes seem, seem cold and distant? Why don't they seem to get the story when a family member calls in crisis? And so we spent, you know, we, Christine and I have talked about this a lot. You know, we're like our, our support group. We like talk every day and we're like, how, how can somebody say no to this family? You know, and we try to understand it. And again, it's not to point fingers, not to say anybody's bad. In fact, just the opposite. We, our, our feeling is that most people in this, in the system, whether they're educators, whether they're, you know, in government, whether they're in providers or in it for the right reason, they probably got into it because they really genuinely care. But somewhere along the way, they, a lot of them seem to lose their way. And why is it? And you know the, the, the recommendation and the, and the observation we make is because there's too much space between decision makers and those affected by decisions. Too much physical space, too much intellectual space, too much emotional space. That's why good, well-intentioned people sometimes don't seem like they care. And again, I, I wanna underscore seem like they don't care. I'm not saying they don't care, but the, it's just the answering the question. And we sort of go through a whole bunch of litanies to sort of, sort of give expression and sort of bring that disconnect to life whether you're a parent of a, of a student with disabilities, whether you're a family in crisis, whether, you know, I mean, we, we go through a whole bunch of different scenarios, but the idea is, I think that's it. And the, the recommendation we make at the end of the report is, is an obvious one, and it's no cost. It's, it's, it's eliminating that space to the extent we can, you know, making sure that those making decisions are in not only one-on-one -on -one contact with individuals and families, but in regular contact. Because we, we got to believe that most people that hear the, the cries from the families and hear the concerns and hear, aren't going to be able to say no. If, you know what I mean? They're going to, or it might be, no, we can't do that, but let's try to figure a way forward, right? So we really think that we need to sort of eliminate the space. One way is to sort of get decision makers out there. You know, we, we recommend going to people's homes. It's a great, great way to do it to the extent you can. But we also need to make a, do a better job of hiring people with disabilities and hiring family members. We need to really make sure that they have a meaningful seat at the table, that they're not only informing the conversations that lead to policy, but they're driving the conversations. Because again, who knows better than people who have a direct personal you know, connection to disability? And one of the things we sort of suggest at the end, I mean, is any organization, any office that works on disability should be largely staffed by people who have that personal lived experience. Uh, we, we, we sort of expect that with all other populations, right? If you have a women's office, if you had an office on you know, immigration or Hispanic, you, right, you, would, you would largely staff that office with people who have that personal lived experience. We haven't done that often with disability and we should do that. And I, we really believe that we'll come out with better policies uh, and a much more responsive sort of uh, system of care. Uh, so that's the sort of general, the eight issues, and I'll just go really go through them quickly. Uh, that we take a deep dive on are abuse and neglect, uh, the appeals process, both for when you're a student as well as when you're an adult, uh, autism, and we focus on severe autism, those with severe challenge behavior, uh, those with uh, complex medical needs, uh, managed care organizations. Uh, I smile at that because I've got so many questions about that. Uh, uh, self-direction, and we focus on one piece of self-direction, sort of this, 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 this threshold that's been put on of $25 an hour. And we sort of really take a deep dive on that. It's a, it's a complex issue, but we try our best to sort of lay it all out there. Uh, and staffing, which we, we know all know is, is, a, is, it was a crisis even before COVID, it's even more of a crisis now. Uh, and lastly, about the report, you know, one of the things, and it's sort of apropos to to this meeting, uh, not only the theme of this meeting, but also how we're doing this sort of this hybrid thing is in our postscript to the report, you know, we talk about that, you know, as, as devastating and tragic as COVID has been for so many uh, people throughout our community, through the larger community, uh, there are some learning, there are some opportunities for learning, uh, good and bad lessons, right? We all know that. And one of them is sort of, you know, use of technology for hybrid meetings, you know? One of the issues obviously we're gonna be dealing with uh, within the adult system, and I'm sure it's, hap it's happening throughout, it's happening in school districts, is sort of you know, virtual versus in-person. And 
you know, we just sort of touch on this at the end because it's such an important issue uh, that we're going to be, as a community, sort of grappling with this year. But you know, our our view is that we we need to find our you know our way forward on both. You know, what I mean, because we know that there's nothing better than the in-person experience. It just, it, it's different, it's richer. There's just, you, you get more out of it. The, the connections, the human connections, the takeaways, everything is better, but that's not always possible for everyone. Uh, not just in the context of COVID, but just, we, we know that, you know, I knew that as when I was mayor of a town, you know, people with disabilities or families with disabilities often show up at council meetings at 7.30 at night because it's hard, right? They've got a lot going on. Uh, we need to find a way, whatever that way is with technology that we can make it as accessible and as meaningful our interactions, not just like meetings like this, but programming, day program, schools, again, municipal uh, governments are doing this, school boards are looking at it, you know, how can they do that? Can we do the hybrid? Can we have things like this so we can make the in-person available to anyone who wants it, uh, but at the same time, make these meetings, make these discussions accessible to those who, who can't be there for whatever reason. So with that, that's sort of everything in a nutshell, I think. I can take some questions. I don't know if you have any for me. Uh, I know my colleagues are, are raring to go too. So what do I do here? <laughs> Someone have a question in the audience first? Sure. Oh, the microphone's coming. We have a question in the audience. Hi, sorry, I came in late. So I missed the, the beginning of the, your presentation. I wanna make sure that, you know, uh, are you, uh, am I understanding that you are a branch new office uh, uh, affiliated with the DDD? So yeah, so we're about four and a half years old and we work closely with DDD. We also work with the Children's System of Care. We work with the Department of Education. We work on, in trying to address all issues that affect children as well as adults with intellectual developmental disabilities. So you basically advocate the kid group. We advocate, we help families advocate. We, we, more often than not though, what we do is just serve as a resource, trying to point people in the right direction, connect them with the right resources. It may not even be on the state level, it might be on the county level or even more locally. Uh, it might be with an advocacy organization. We just try to connect people and make sure that they have the resources that they need. I see, so you, have, you have work very closely uh, with DDD, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So if I have some some questions or com comments regarding the uh, the uh, Medicaid supported uh, day program, can I present it to you? You can present it to me. You're going to have a chance to talk to Jonathan Seafried in just a little while. Uh, okay. uh, but yeah, I'll give you my card also, and you know we okay. we can talk one on one also. Yeah. Actually, my my question it could be shared with everybody else, so I would like to take the sure. opportunity to jump ahead and present my. My concern. My daughter received very good services at uh, Livingston, uh, a place called Way Center. It's, it's a wonderful place. And it's under JSDD uh, umbrella, a Way Center, brand new facility, nice staff. And it's an art oriented uh, center. And she's been there, going there for more than 10 years. Now, because of the uh, now the uh, Medicaid play a very, very important role. So they put so many restrictions uh, as, as to uh, how the funding is uh, channeled to the day program. My understanding is that if I wanna take my daughter for vacation for two weeks, okay, okay I'm retired. So I can take a vacation as long as I need. And uh, then the, the problem is that the, uh, the, her day center will not receive the Right. The, the money for the day, even she is sick, they're not getting the money paid for the day that she's sick. So I think this is a very, very uh, not reasonable, not logical uh, uh, res restriction. You know, why, why my daycare per day center would not get paid if I take my uh, my daughter away for two weeks vacation. They still need to keep the, the facility, the staffing number are the same, but they're not getting paid by the right. uh, the DDD. Sure. So I'll, I'll explain. So we used to have a contract system. And Jonathan can address this later and probably better. But we used to have a contract system, and so in that in a scenario like that, they would still get paid because they were getting paid, let's say, on a monthly basis. The provider. Now we're in fee for service, and so you're paying for the service delivered. Uh, 
you know, from a budgetary, from a taxpayer perspective, it makes sense, right? You don't want to pay for things. But there's been a recognition that, that that's not always possible, you know? And so early on, uh, I think since the beginning, uh, DDD for, had a, what they call an absentee rate for, for the residential, for group homes, for somebody who goes on vacation or leaves a group home and stuff, but they didn't have that for day programs, but now they do. And Jonathan can talk to you about that. So there's a certain amount of absences that would be sort of provided for, uh, but I'll, I'll let him address it in specifics, but it's, it's a very good point. And again, it's something that DDD is, is addressing. Yeah, and just real quick, uh, uh, we morning, added last you. year um, a uh, five. I received a report from the ombudsman, and I, I like what you do. You know, it's been such a big change for the positive in the families and children and adults with disabilities since your office was created. It's really, really good. Um, my uh, observation is uh, to your point of the disconnect. And I think I can uh, talk from experience that there's the emotional part on part of the family, on the part of the family that doesn't resonate or with the politicians in charge, okay? Or the state or whomever. Uh, some people empathize better than other, but um, you know, you, you know my story, but when we went to the county, for instance, we were the crazy ladies demanding services because we were in a crisis and they are the clinical people just observing us, oh, look how quaint they are, you know, they're all, you know, up in arms. The same thing happened with DDD when there was this question of the placement, it was like an emergency placement. And still, you know, it looked from our port point of view that they're sitting on their thumbs. And from their point of view is what a pain these people are. You know, so it, I think we need a mediator somehow created for this kind of meetings, maybe to appease the family that is in crisis and is really, has been in crisis maybe for a long time. And also for the politicians or whomever is in charge to have a more empathy and, you know, and be more sensitive to the needs, you know. And as you said, it's better that they go to the places, do they go to the families uh, homes, they go to the day centers. I mean, it made a big difference in my county, for instance, when the uh, commissioners at the time went to the day center where my son was. So they saw them firsthand, you know, and they saw the kind of work they do and they saw the staff. So, you know, it changed their lives really. And they did something about it, but it's this disconnect, so. Yeah, I hope you'll find like the good mediator, like they're finding court in family court and everything else. Yeah. Th thank you. I mean, thanks for the kind words about our office. Yeah. And, you know, it's just we, we you know, we're thinking of Peter Sellers, you know, there's no substitute for being there. Right. It's just it's it, there really isn't, you know, for anybody to see, to feel, to, to experience something. And so, yeah, we you know, one of the things so we sort of break it out in, in the report, uh, you know, it's looking at sort of the, the th three reasons, you know, you know, from a difference in perspective, from a difference in expectations, from a difference sort of in motivation, you know, decision makers and people affected by decisions look at, you know, approach these issues differently. Uh, and uh, I'm glad you had that experience with the commissioners because it does make a difference. And again, most people go into public service, you know, whether you agree with them or not, you know, or in it for the right reason. And, you know, people that are in, definitely working on disability issues are in it for the right reason. They just have to be reminded, I think, of why they got into it and why it's so important. Uh, so thank you for that, Anna. Appreciate it. Another question. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Scott Cohen, Region Council Number Five. Paul, thank you for being here and all that your office does. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to read through um, the uh, U.S. Department of Education's report at the end of January that they issued to Congress. It's the 43rd annual report of the IDEA Act, mm -hmm. and in that report, I'm still going through it, it's hundreds of pages of long, but the essence of it was that New Jersey is just behind Hawaii as the most restrictive state in terms of implementation of classroom environments in the United States. And it was a fascinating, you know, it's a fascinating read. It's just a lot of stuff to go through. So I know it's not the role necessarily of your office, but we continue to go back to how do we build bridges between the different departments across the state of New Jersey with the under 21 population specifically before they head out into transition. And if that's where New Jersey is right now, according to the state hmm. 
uh, the United States Department of Education, I think that speaks volumes in terms of work that we need to be doing in our schools. So I don't know if that would be a place for your for your department to take kind of a look at that. Sure. And I can certainly forward it to you if you if you want a copy of it or if you can access it, it's on the internet. Yeah. But I don't know if you have any thoughts or opinions on that, but I just thought I'd throw that out there. I don't know that there's a question in there, but again, just more about the collaboration between departments. Right, and I appreciate that, Scott. And, uh, you know, so special education is not something I have a direct experience with. Uh, my, my colleague, Christine, you know, it, it ha has personal experience with that as well as professional. Uh, and we work very closely with the, the New Jersey Department of Education, particularly they have a special education ombudsperson. Uh, so we, we work directly with her. But, you know, from, from my perspective, my personal perspective is, you know, I mean, we've got, you know, a lot of autonomous, pretty much autonomous school districts throughout this, you know, and each one does it differently, like they do everything else differently. And you find some that are great. And we hear great stories from some families about how their school district and the officials there work very closely with the families trying to make sure that their that this student gets everything they need. And then we hear others, it's just like a pitchfork battle. Uh, and it's so unnecessary. It's so, you know, you think of what families have to deal with to begin with, uh, and then a special needs family in particular, but then to have to battle your school district, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the resources that go into the financial, emotional, everything that, you know, it's just, it's, it's so unfortunate. Uh, I don't know how we wrap our head around that. I don't know, but I'd love to definitely, definitely be interested in looking at the report. It's something, you know, and again, we engage with our colleagues. We have the ability to sort of engage with Department of Education as well as local officials. Uh, so yeah, so let's let's talk offline also about that. Yeah. How about some audience questions from Paul? We have uh, Leah online that has had her hand up. Leah, if you want to just unmute yourself and just introduce yourself to to Paul. Hi, hi, uh, hi, Paul. First, my name is uh, Leah. I'm from Central Jersey. And uh, first, I just want to say a good job. This is the first time I've ever been to a, um, a hybrid meeting in my life, and I'm, I'm impressed. I just want to say that, first of all. <laughs> and um, the second thing is, um, um, I need help. I don't know what to do. Um, I have a soon-to-be 20-year-old um, disabled daughter who has autism, ADHD, and now, thanks to the pandemic, she now has depression and anxiety. Um, she's doing much better but there's several obstacles involved. And I also have physical and mental health issues I have to deal with now because after having COVID in December and my mom who's disabled. So I don't have the energy for this, but what she's doing right now is not enough. I need to get her. She's not really, I don't feel she's at the point where she's able to work right now. So she needs at least to do something really, um, I can't think of the word. Um, what is the word where she's really like structured or whatever? She needs to really like, like, like serious, like serious, Why is it echoing? Is it done? Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. What happened? Oh, um, serious, um, you know, um, volu volunteer work and also transportation can be in barrier. Like it has to be. Why is it doing that? I'm sorry. I don't know why that's doing that, but um, something that's, I don't have to use a lot of gas to take her to if I have to take her or if somehow the Medicaid transportation could take her, but she, I need, I don't know how, what's the best way to go about doing that with the volunteer, some kind of serious volunteer work for her to do. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, what, what I suggest is, I mean, so you're, you're going through the, the transition years and there's a lot of issues to sort of unpack and to, to work through. Uh, I'll, I would suggest you contact our office uh, and we can give you the contact information for that. We can sort of work through some of those issues. Again, you also have the benefit of having come on after me, uh, both Jonathan Seafried who represents the adult system and Molly Green who represents a lot of the, the children's system. Uh, and we, you know, they can maybe answer some of your questions or address some of your points, but there's a, there's a lot to unpack when you're going through those transition years. And frankly, that's one of the reasons, uh, not in this year's annual report, but in the last two annual reports, one of the things we suggest, because we, we try to address that transition issue, it's the, it's the time of, you know, when parents say that they feel like they're falling off the cliff. Uh, and because you're going from a system of entitlements up to age 21 to a system when things, you don't have entitlements to, to the programs and services. There's a lot of resources in the adult system, but you need to know about them. You need to go out and get them. Uh, and on top of that, you know, you're transitioning from, from a pediatric care to an adult doctor you're transitioning on transportation issues. You're looking at issues like guardianship and supportive decision-making. There's a lot, there's Medicaid, there's social security. So there's a lot of issues that, that a family has to address there. 
So in our last two reports, one of the things we suggested is it would be great if the state somehow, you know, rather than going to each school district and saying, you need to do this, you need to do that, because we know that doesn't necessarily work, uh, make available to every family, every, you know, every, every child, that, you know, student that has an IEP, you know, whether eight, age 18 or even 17, some type of case manager who can just get them through those transition years, who can be a resource to answer questions like the ones you're raising, uh, because there, there is nobody. I mean, you might be in a school district where there is a transition coordinator who's capable of that, but you're more often than not, we find that folks are not in those kinds of school districts where people are capable of answering those questions. And frankly, and this is an issue, and not to sort of uh, go backwards, but you know, an issue we addressed in our report last year is, you know, we talked about falling off a cliff. You know, we really have this, this really haunting feeling that a lot of folks with disabilities in this state fall off the grid. Uh, and what, I, what we mean by that is that, you know, they, they have this system up to age 21 where federally and state, you know, state law says you, you get services and supports. But after 21, they, they just fall off the grid. They don't know what services are, exist. They don't know what supports exist. They don't know who to ask. You don't know what you don't know. And there's a lot of folks and, you know, and we can go into this and if anyone's interested, I'd say, go back and look at our report from last year, which is on our website. Uh, but it's, it's a real serious issue. You know, the, the numbers themselves sort of speak to, you know, people falling off the grid. And so Lee, you're not alone in not having these questions. I would, again, you'll, you're here from my colleagues in a little while, reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to, you know, come meet with you and sort of work through a lot of these issues but there should be somebody that's available to families that can answer a lot of these questions. Go ahead, Daddy. Oh, I just, there was a comment in the chat, Paul, uh, from Lisa it, regarding your report. She's saying it was a good comprehensive report covering current issues in history. I would highly recommend that you, that everyone read it as having it having all that context in the back of your mind when you're advocating for yourself or your loved one will make your efforts more informed and therefore possibly more effective. And that is from Lisa. Great, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, um, appreciate it. And then Patty has a question. So, um, I have a comment first and a question. The comment is, uh, for Leah, uh, you might want to consider reaching out to your local regional family support planning council. As you described your issue, I was reminded of a woman who came to Region 2 um, at our last meeting who had very similar issues. And we spent 45 minutes brainstorming with her and, and identifying resources and just generally giving her some support. Um, the, co the question I have is... Um, Paul, you're an amazing resource. And the fact that you are now advocating for us on a federal level is very, very impressive. Um, and I, I know you're gathering information to put together an agenda um, that you can put forward on your most recent um, appointment. Um, my concern, of course, is, is what you, I've, we've already talked about this. And, and one more time, I just wanna share um, Paul uh, participated in a healthcare town hall on April 16th, which was amazing because there were a, a great range of healthcare concerns that I was not aware of, but Paul sat through and listened carefully. But um, if, you could, if you could share a little bit about what is on your agenda on a federal level that that would be great. Sure, I appreciate it, Dottie, thank you. Uh, so again, I was recently appointed to the President's Committee for People with Intellectual Disabilities. It's an advisory body, as it was mentioned. Uh, it's a two-year appointment. Uh, I think there's 21 of us public members and then there's some government officials. Uh, I've got a lot of ideas, but we haven't started the process. We're doing, I'm, I'm swamped with paperwork right now, onboarding. Uh, so I think we have our first meeting uh, early June. Uh, so I'll have a better sense of sort of what I can and can't do and stuff. But there are a lot of issues. And we talked about Medigap during that, that meeting. And I, I met with Beverly, Beverly Roberts Bob afterwards Bob. and we talked more thoroughly. Uh, there were a lot of issues. One of them uh, we've, I've recently engaged with uh, actually Senator Menendez's office on is this, this sort of penalty, if you would, the marriage penalty that a lot of families, you know, individuals, two people with disabilities that, you know, have, get both get supplemental security income and Medicaid. 
if they get married, they get penalized and they lose their resources. Uh, and I know Senator Menendez is a sponsor of a bill to address this, the supplemental security income uh, piece of it. Uh, we're trying to talk, we're talking through about the Medicaid piece, but there are a lot of uh, federal issues. Uh, frankly, you know, in, in this job, you know, you know, we, we've been small and so overwhelmingly busy. We haven't had the bandwidth to sort of tackle some of these federal issues, uh, but we are hoping now we, we can do that. And I'd love to hear ideas people have. Again, I don't really know what I'll be able to do, you know, how I'll be able to do, but uh, it's definitely an opportunity. We'll do what we can. Thanks. Um, so I know you have to run, Paul. This yeah. is Gabrielle Bohan. I'm vice chair of the Family Support Pl Statewide Support Family Support Planning Council. Um, an idea, the ARC, the, um, the national ARC, I saw a poll came out yesterday, trying to get support because our SSI $2,000 resource was implemented, I think they said in 1989, and has not been ra raised right. since. And if anybody understands how you know, finances work right now, $2,000 is not a lot of money. The ABLE account helps. That's the Achieving Better Life Experience account, which you can use to store some money in so that you don't go over that 2,000 limit, but it is so easy for people to go over. So if you're looking for ideas, maybe we can raise that. Um, that's a long time for living under such a small amount and savings for our loved ones. A absolutely, and that's, that's the, actually the piece of legislation I was talking about that Senator Menendez and a bunch of others are supporting. It's to raise it, I believe, to $10,000, the asset level. That would be great. <laughs> and for individuals and for a married couple, it'd be 20,000, it would double it like it should be. And, you know, Right now, I think it's 2,000, and if you get married, it's 3,000, which makes absolutely no sense. We uh, so yeah, we have one one more person with their hand up, Susan, and that will be the last question because we definitely want to get you out of here on time. Okay. Susan, do you want to ask a question? Hi, Hi, good morning, Paul. I just wanted to personally thank you um, for including my story in the annual report um, as a redacted email, and I, I think that it's just important for a number of reasons, but. This, having these stories be told and not hidden and hidden in all of the homes um, and hidden away in programs and hidden away in facilities, I think it's really powerful. And I want there to be a face and I want my face to be seen and I want my son's voice to be heard. Um, and you have allowed that to happen. And our, our problems have not found solutions, um, but I'm hopeful that we will find solutions and I'm grateful and thankful to all of the parents and to all the people who have advocated and fought for decades for freedom, for freedom with, for people with the most significant disabilities, for them to have the freedom to choose and to live their lives. And that's Alex. Alex. Um, and that's it. I just want to say thank you. And I appreciate you. Thank you so thank much. You so much. And, we, and we appreciate you. And Christine and I have had the opportunity to work with Susan uh, pretty extensively. And as she alluded to, one of the things we include in the report is a redacted email that she had written that, that says it all. Uh, and we also, you know, throughout the report, we have different quotes, you know, from family members. And the reason we do that is because no one can tell the story again better than family members themselves and the individuals. Uh, rather than filtering it through us, we would try to give it to uh, unfiltered. And Susan, you know, thank you for letting us use that because I think it is a powerful, it, it's such a powerful message. I think anyone who reads it will sort of get it, it should get it, so. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much thank for you. hybrid meeting. Thank you, thank you so much, Paul, for showing up in person. <laughs> we appreciate you. A round of applause. <laughs> okay. All righty. So I didn't introduce myself earlier, I don't think. So just so you all know, um, I'm Eileen Hurley, and I am the chairperson for the New Jersey Family Support Planning Council's statewide council. And um, my, I have um, a lovely son, Colin, who's 31, who still lives home with us. And we have many challenges with this you know, going through COVID and going through the pandemic with services and support. So that's why, you know, we're, we're very interested in hearing what Molly and um, Jonathan have 
to say about these issues that folks are having. So I'd like to, I'm pleased to uh, announce Molly Green, who is the Assistant Commissioner for the Children's System of Care. Molly has been a member of the DCF family since 2014, serving in the role of Director of Clinical Services, where she leads a broad portfolio of services connected to health and behavioral health of children served by the department. Through the Office of Clinical Services, Molly and her team manage the, child, the uh, child health and child and family nurse programs that deliver health care case management for children in and out of home placements. She also oversees the department's forensic medical and psychological services, including the regional diagnostic and treatment centers. She has developed DCF's peer recovery support program for children, uh, welfare involved parents with substance use order, uh, disorders, and she leads the department's work to develop plans of safe care for substance uh, affected infants. So we're, we're, we're really, really pleased to have Molly uh, address what's going on right now uh, in on the children's side. So <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction. Well, I think we have to probably turn off the microphone. Um, <clears throat> Yoko, can you? Okay, I think we're good now. Thanks. Um, so thanks for that introduction. And I appreciate you sharing a little bit about my, um, my background and biography before I, um, you know, started working with the children's system of care um, just a little over three years ago. And um, the services that you talked about are so are now um, managed under the children's system of care as well as um, services and supports for children with um, mental health, behavioral health needs, intellectual and developmental disabilities, as well as substance use disorders. So um, in coming to, to talk with you all today, I wanted to focus on a number of um, current um, activities and initiatives and to provide an update rather than an in-depth overview of the children's system of care and in particular services for children with IDD needs. I'm going to Thanks. <laughs> no, I'm no, still I'm getting, getting some getting feedback, feedback, so I'm going to have to stop talking until we can get the, there we go. We can just eliminate the feedback. Thank you. So folks can hear what I'm saying. Thanks. I know <laughs> it's a, it's this is what happens when we have a hybrid meeting. It's a little messy, but we'll get there. Um, so so, you know, in the event that there's um, other information or if you wanted me to come back and do a really deeper dive on you know, the entire array of services and supports and processes that we have in place, I'm happy to do that. Um, but for today, I wanted to focus on a couple of um, specific things and I would like to share my screen. And there we go. Can folks see my screen? I think you need to give me permission to share. We can see. You can see it. Okay, great. Okay, so then I'm going to do this. And hopefully that's, there we go. Okay. So um, we wanted to, what I wanted to do today was to really try to focus on some of the things that we've been working on, in particular during the pandemic. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we have done and what we're continuing to do to try to maintain and improve our eligibility processes, um, give you some information about the current status and activities around some of our other services, including family support services, and then some sort of looking ahead to where we um, expect to be going with some, I think, really exciting and um, initiatives that are going to, um, I think, provide further support um, for many of the children um, that, we, that we serve. So um, during the pandemic, we worked very hard with uh, Perform Care, our contracted services administrator, to ensure that we were uh, maintaining timely determination of eligibility. Um, and we did um, a walkthrough of the um, application process in response to many concerns 
um, and frustrations from, from family members and other stakeholders about the burden of that process. And we found what you often find when you do a process walkthrough, which is that the process is the problem. <laughs> and so um, we, one of the, I think, very significant changes, and some of you may have heard me talk about this before, but to me, it was extremely important is that prior to um, this recent adjustment, if a young person's application for eligibility um, was, um, could not be approved, um, it would be, I hate this word, but it would be denied. And then a family would have to file an appeal. And once that appeal was filed, we would then have uh, conduct a face-to-face -face evaluation with the child. And when we, under, when we really began to understand how much of a barrier this is, because many families, you know, either, you know, don't have the time, the resources, the availability, or, you know, the, you know, the, the patient, I don't want to use the word patience, but at this point, families are very frustrated. And to we, so what we did was we eliminated that requirement. And so now the process is such that if we cannot um, come to a determination of eligibility through the review of all of the documents that are submitted, our, um, our, our state psychologist will conduct the face-to-face -face evaluation. Um, and since we've changed this process, we've seen almost an entire elimination of, um, of denials of eligibility, and we've eliminated the need to go through that burdensome appeal process for families. So um, we've also shifted to where possible, we will conduct this evaluation via telehealth if that's, you know, if that if we can do that and still meet the standard of care to further reduce the burden on families of having to travel any farther than is necessary to complete that evaluation. We also made some changes to the uh, timeframes for the clinical assessments that are required when a family is applying for eligibility. It was very important to us that we align the timeframes, particularly for children who reach school age, with those three-year IEP evaluation cycles. And um, it's a little bit more frequent for ch children who are younger for a variety of reasons, including you know, the, the developmental milestones that, um, that we're looking at for very young children. Um, or um, they can change much more dramatically in a much shorter period of time. Whereas once we're at school age, we also know that children are you know, receiving services in the school. One of the things that we have been doing is we've really been trying, I, I hope you will carry this back to folks who weren't able to join us today. We really wanna encourage families to think about um, if their child has an IEP, whether or not it really makes sense for them to waive their rights to that um, three-year evaluation. Many families do waive their right to that, and for many children, it may not be appropriate. You know, unnecessary evaluation is, is invasive and um, don't want to subject children to that if it's not necessary. However, that evaluation can also be a part of the, can also inform the eligibility determination process and would provide information to, um, to the reviewers, avoiding the need to pay for additional evaluations out of pocket, which I know many families do. So please just, you know, to the extent that you can kind of help us spread the word about that. Um, also the chart outlining those um, eligibility, um, those uh, requirements is now available in both English and Spanish on the Perform Care website. Um, we also have recently done a, um, sort of a completed a reformation and cleanup of our English language application, which is currently live on the website. We try to reduce, like, you know, simplify the language, um, really look for more clarity for families who are reading this and to make it more understandable and accessible. Um, so that's currently live on our website. And then the second phase of this project is translating this application into um, the five identified languages that are most commonly requested, Spanish, Korean, Chinese, Portuguese, and Gujarati. Right now, what we do is if we need to provide the application in a language other than English, we will have that translated for the family, but these will now be posted and immediately available um, on the website. And we expect that those um, will be available in June. We, that's the date for project uh, completion. And then um, in our office of uh, the deputy director, Melinda Carnesal, I think some of you have met with and worked with Melinda over the last few years as she's also participated in our regular meetings with the uh, Family Support Planning Council. Um, she has um, taken on um, as a special, not special, but a particular project in focus, a number of 
activities that are really designed to try to, again, improve the experience of the application process, um, the determination process, and what the family experience is when you're waiting for that response. So um, we did a lot of work earlier this year to um, review and revise the monthly reports that we received from Perform Care, where we track the um, timeliness to determination. And we've been, we had um, earlier this year, I think February and March, we had the highest volume of new applications that we've ever had in a two month period um, in early 2022. And we've worked very hard with Perform Care and they've also um, brought on some additional and reassigned some staff to assist with the reviews. I'm really proud to say that we have no applications at this point that have been complete and waiting for review for more than 90 days and um, fewer and fewer that are over 60 days. So we are, I think, tracking with our timeliness as um, we've improved our timeliness there, even at a time where there's very high volume. We also took a hard look at the definitions and this of the different status of the application, because what does it mean when an application is complete? So, um, and we, we did a deep walkthrough of that with Perform Care and we, um, we, revised some of those definitions. We got very clear in terms of what we mean when an application is complete, when it's complete but pending review, because often when once we go into the review process, there may be some other documentation that we need to request. We also uh, reviewed all of the different letters that we typically send to families. We had we had 18 separate letters that we sent. We sent different versions of correspondence that we may send to families while they're going through the review process. And we've consolidated and simplified that so that families who are waiting for determination will be receiving more um, timely and I think specific and clear um, updates on the status of that application. Um, and we are, you know, to make sure that families are being updated and reviewed and they're not waiting, there's no radio silence and you're not waiting for more than, you know, a few months to get that response. We've also had um, some uh, conversations most recently and some feedback with um, the Family Support Planning Council members to provide recommendations to us on the specific content of the Perform Care website um, around applying for eligibility determinations. And we are now working with Perform Care, our contracted vendor, um, to see what kinds of changes we can be able to implement and what a timeline for those changes will look like. So that is an IT project, so it will be part of our IT project plan. Um, and getting that onto the plan and setting some timeframes, since once we've established that, we'll be able to share that information back to um, the members of the planning council that we've been working with on that. Um, a couple of other updates. Um, earlier, I was gonna say earlier this year was actually in the fall, we published a request for qualifications for um, providers of intensive in-home clinical services. This was, um, we knew that we wanted to do this, but we also did have um, some feedback from advocates really urging us to um, move in this direction. And so we did, we left it um, open for I don't want to say a long time, but we wanted to, because we were publishing it, and then of course we went into Omicron, so I think we had a little bit of foresight, we extended the application period to be open until the very end of April to allow as many providers as possible the opportunity to come in and submit their um, submit their applications. We're currently, the, the, the period closed at the end of April, we're currently reviewing those applications and um, any of the providers that meet the requirements in terms of their credentials, their, their expertise, their practice, um, and the other con you know, the requirements to, to contract and do business with the state of New Jersey, um, they will be enrolled in the network. And we really wanted in this RFQ, we really highlighted the um, encouraging providers that deliver, um, that, that practice in the, that use the DIR floor time um, modality to um, also come in and apply because that's something in particular that families had um, expressed an interest in. And so um, probably, let me see, I think we meet with you again in um, probably the middle of June. Hopefully by the middle of June, we'll have been able, we should be able to have completed that um, application review. Um, summer camp, um, the last two years were extremely frustrating. I know for many, many families, we had really no camp at all in 2022, in 2020, 
um, which was a tremendous loss. And last year, you know, given the um, the circumstances and the accommodations that had to be made around COVID in order for camps to operate safely, we did not have as many of our camps available and open and participating as we had hoped. Um, this summer, things are looking a little bit different. We currently have 45 camps that are um, accepting applications. Two of those are overnight camps. We have capacity for, to serve up to 4,500 children um, in the current camps, but we think that that is going to increase as camps are still hiring their staff. We have just under 600 applications for camp that have been submitted at this time. Um, we are gonna continue to accept those applications pretty much on a rolling basis. In prior years, we would kind of cut cut, you know, close off or have sort of a, a deadline for families to submit those requests. And we've shifted that practice during COVID because, um, you know, in recognition of the, the uncertainty, um, families, you know, needing to weigh those options, make the best decision for themselves and for their children. So I would ask you also to share and make that information available that we do still have scholarships open um, and available for children who are eligible for those scholarships. And about half of the camps are also providing one-on-one -on -one services. And we have about a capacity for about a thousand children to receive those one-on-one -on -one services in camp. And we know that for many children, it's the accessibility of the one-on-one -on -one support that makes it possible for them to participate in camp. So we really do not wanna see these services and these funds going unutilized um, during the season. So please share that information. The application is, you know, it's available information on the website and um, I can, you know, provide more information about that process if that's helpful. Um, there will be in summer camp, we have had some questions about this. There will not be any um, vaccine mandates for camp. We are continuing to follow the DOH camp guidance, which will remain that camp staff and campers over the age of five are encouraged to have, um, to be vaccinated against COVID. Um, but camps will not be required to implement the mitigation strategies that were required during the um, 2021 summer season. So we think that that will give everybody a much better experience. Um, there's also, um, we've been made aware, there's an allocation of rapid tests available for camps that are serving uh, school-aged children and camps can order those to the New Jersey Department of Health. Um, and we believe that there should be, an, that they can order enough to get folks through the summer program. And that's another resource that we think will help the camps to maintain their, um, their operations. Um, finally, another um, thing that I'm very happy to finally be able to announce, I think that Melinda shared this with some folks last week, we have been able to identify um, and onboard our family liaison for intellectual and developmental disabilities. This individual will be working in our Office of Constituent Services. Um, so she will be starting, I think, in about two to three weeks, at which time we will share her name and you know, information about her background and experience. Um, she will be working with families, system partners, and advocates to identify and address service gaps, barriers to access, and challenges that we experience um, in order to build capacity for service identification, coordinating um, across systems, as well as helping families to navigate and collaborating with our internal and our external system partners. So she'll be working with families, with the CMOs, with our family support services providers, and um, with our other service providers and, and treatment providers. Um, and uh, very excited to have her joining after having been without that position for two years um, and having you know, challenges really identifying and bringing onboarding somebody who we thought was really the right person to um, to get the work done. Um, so, so then just want to share a little bit about um, looking ahead. Um, there are a couple of initiatives in the um, 1115 Medicaid waiver renewal. So in New Jersey, we have what's called a comprehensive demonstration waiver, and 1115 is just the um, the regulatory authority under which um, the federal government allows us to do this. Um, under the waiver, we are able to provide um, other services that are not part of the Medicaid state plan to particular populations. We can also provide certain coverages to individuals who would not otherwise be eligible for that coverage. 
And so um, there are two components that we will be looking at with the waiver. It, our current waiver expires in June of this year. Um, we anticipate we're, just, we're gonna have an extension because as with many other administrative processes over the last two years, it's taking a little bit longer for things to get um, to be accomplished because of the other co work, COVID specific related work that at the state and federal level, but we, you know, we anticipate, you know, seeing this as we move um, later into the, to the year. And so under the, um, once we have approval of the, um, of this um, current application that's in with the federal government, we have um, notified them that we expect to implement our full authority for children with IDD um, needs and also propose that there will be a parental income disregard when we're determining Medicaid eligibility for um, certain children who are receiving CSOC services. So what this means in, I think, you know, plain English is that right now under the current waiver authority, when a child enters an out-of-home program, a residential treatment program under CSOC, if they, um, they're now considered a, sort of considered a household of one, and then they are, um, they're, um, they're reviewed for Medicaid eligibility. And there's, a, there's an asset test. Um, so children who have assets above, you know, 2000, I think it's $2,000 um, at this point, um, there's, that income is taken into consideration, but there's a disregard of parental income. And we've been doing that for many years for children with um, behavioral health needs. Under the current waiver, we, we have the authority and we will now begin to exercise that authority for children with um, intellectual and de developmental disabilities who may be going into residential care, um, which is important. But I think the, the new component, which I think is in some, for some, for many families, I think it will be a game changer. Um, so that even if a family has, um, private insurance, if their child will also be, um, may be eligible for the Medicaid benefit, again, we have to consider that there would be a parental income disregard. And that, that would mean that children who are meeting that level, if the child has um, that same level of need that would um, warrant their enrollment in care management organization services, they would also have access to those other state plan benefits which we think will be very helpful for many families. And then the last sort of new initiative that I wanna talk about is um, our intensive in community treatment model in the spring of 2021, which seems now like a very long time ago. Um, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services announced to all of the states um, the availability of some funding um, for um, some American Rescue Plan funding that would be made available to the states to um, ex enhance, expand, or, or extend home and community-based services, including services provided under the children's system of care. Um, we didn't have a lot of time to turn around a proposal um, to um, submit to the federal government, to CMS. Fortunately, we had been working within CSOC, we'd been working on a an in-community um, treatment program model design. We actually started working on this in the, toward the end of 2019, um, but had not yet identified a way to finance or stand up this pilot. Um, so we did receive approval on this proposal that we submitted just about a year ago in, in March. And the goal of this program is to really provide in the community and in a family's home, the same level of intensity of services and supports that many youth would otherwise need to go into an out of home setting in order to receive those services. Um, and, you know, we do know that while um, many youth do benefit from and it is appropriate and medically necessary for them to access services in an out of home setting, there are a couple of challenges there. One is that you know, even when a youth has to go into even a short term setting, um, having a child leave their home then creates the challenge of having to facilitate and return that child to their home and to their community and to all of those supports that they would otherwise have at home. Um, and when a child is in a residential setting, it's very, it can be very challenging to really facilitate that transition plan home because the skills um, and the strengths and the, um, the milestones that have been met in that residential setting, we want to be able to then make sure that those are not that, that those are be able to be maintained in the home. 
And that transition can often be very challenging for families. And it may feel that the gains that have been met in the out of home setting as a child is returning home, and we now need to you know, get that plan in place in the home, um, it, can be very, it can be very difficult. And so not having to go out of home in order to get that level of comprehensive care for many families will offer um, you know, a very, we hope, uh, a viable and attractive alternative. Um, we also know that um, right now, and if any of you know or you know someone whose child is waiting for out of home services, we are currently seeing in the children's system of care, care unprecedented historic demand for services in every service line, mobile response, out of home, um, care management organization, and intensive in-home services. And we have a situation now where the demand is higher than ever, and because of COVID and the impact on our workforce, um, we are stretched more than we ever have been. And so the waiting list is a challenge, it's sort of a structural problem where we have more demand than we have beds available, and we have many of our out-of-home programs are holding off on admissions or they're having to reduce their capacity because they do not have the staff um, to keep kids safe in those residential programs. And so we are hoping that this model will be an alternative that once we've piloted it through this um, particular um, initiative, we will be able to make the case for, um, and it's successful and we see the outcomes are what we're hoping they will be, we'll be able to make the case for increased funding for this kind of an in-community in-home service. Um, this will be a flexible mobile team. Um, they will be a multidisciplinary treatment team that will include um, psychiatrists, nursing staff, ABA therapists, um, respite workers. Um, there's a number of other components that we've built in that are designed not, not just to address the needs of children, but also of the family. And so that additional respite component that's built in, we think is very, very important um, for this program in particular. And we're working now on finalizing the design. Um, typically, I can't talk about an upcoming procurement um, because of our procurement rules, but because it's public knowledge and information that we've received the um, the approval to um, move this program forward, you know, I can I can share that we will be issuing an RFP in the in the very near future. Um, we also hope that we'll be able to demonstrate that there's a return on investment, meaning that we're able to achieve the same or you know you know better outcomes for children in the community at a lower cost and that we can potentially reinvest those dollars into um, more of the kind of in-home model that we would like to see. So that is it for me. Um, I have um, the website for Perform Care. I've also shared with you the, um, the best email address if you want to reach out to the division. Um, our director's uh, email box is, is monitored, not just daily, but hourly. Um, and the staff that manage that mailbox make sure that any messages go to the right person in the division so that you don't have to go hunting and searching to figure out who is it that I need to talk to about this. We will help you with that. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. I'm having trouble doing this. Thank you. Well, thank you, Molly. Uh, uh, this is John Seyfried, uh, Assistant Commissioner, New Jersey Division of Developmental Disabilities. So it's a pleasure to be with you all today and very thankful that uh, uh, the council uh, reached out to- I'm not on. Uh, oh, now I am. Okay. Thank you, Molly, for that. And, and if, if, you, um, if you are available, we're, we're just gonna save the few questions until after Jonathan. That would be, that would be great, thank you. Great. Okay, so I am pleased to uh, announce uh, Jonathan Seafree, who is the Assistant Commissioner of the Division of Developmental Disabilities. He has taken on the role uh, since 2017. His decades long career has been centered on serving individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Since joining the division, he's held leadership roles in many critical areas, including large scale institutional to community transitions, significant progress on waiting list placement, and as the director of housing, um, 
and working with the establishment of portable housing subsidies. Prior to joining the division in 2001, he worked as an IDD case manager for a nonprofit provider. And Mr. Seafried has uh, received both his Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and Master's of Arts in, in Instructional Technology from Stockton University. And on a personal note, I would just like to say that Jonathan and is wonderful with working uh, with the Family Support Planning Council and the Family Advisory Council. And we've been collaborating uh, with him for years and we're really appreciative of all he does for our families. Great, thank you so much for that, Eileen. Uh, just quick check, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, okay. All right, so I'm just gonna share my screen. And okay, and can everybody see uh, the main uh, slide? Okay, great. All right, so uh, good. I guess it is still morning to everybody. So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for making time and inviting myself, uh, Paul, and Molly over to your uh, the Regional Family Support Planning Council meeting today. Uh, we're very excited to be here and to, uh, you know, any opportunity to interact with uh, families and individuals is, uh, you know, a, a welcome thing. Um, very appreciative of the collaboration that the division has with both the DD Council and uh, the Regional Family Support Planning Councils and the Ombudsman's Office. So with that, I do have, uh, you know, a presentation to go through. Um, the uh, uh, obviously the topic for today is very important and uh, very dense. Uh, so uh, what I mean by that is there's just a lot going on in terms of just transitioning and you know uh, in the endemic world and just what we're doing to you know normalize things once again. So with that, like uh, not everything is in here that we're doing, but um, trying you know looking at the time we have, I kind of tried to pick out some areas and I'll you know throw in some other things too. And I want to make sure we have time for. Uh, questions. So um, overall, I'm going to go over uh, uh, several key things that I thought would be uh, uh, helpful to the uh, the group to make sure information's out there on. The first is our Office of Education on Self-Directed Services. Uh, the second, I want to talk about our Direct Support Professional Competency and Capacity Building Steering Committee. I want to talk about wages. That's something that has been coming up, uh, come up a lot. Uh, it's always been challenging in a, the human services field uh, in, in wages, and I think that's true of multiple divisions and departments, uh, but we have made some good strides. Uh, our work is not done, but we've been able to uh, address some elements there. Also, uh, support coordination rate increase that we're able to do and go over some updates we did to our manuals, all with the intention of adding increased education and flexibility to our system. So uh, first off, um, for those of you that don't know, um, we uh, recently launched uh, earlier this year, a new office at the division. It's the Office of Education on Self-Directed Services. Um, we recognize at the division that uh, uh, individuals and their families need to be aware of all their options are related to how they can receive services. Uh, we have, uh, you know, for decades in New Jersey, had the traditional, we call provider managed service model where an agency provides services. And that can work for people. And that is a valid choice and one that, that can be taken. And it, it does work for some. Uh, we are growing uh, in terms of self direction, though. And what we found through our interactions, both at the Family Advisory Council and different uh, stakeholder interactions, that self-direction, uh, while it can work, uh, it didn't. There wasn't a sole the repository uh, for that information where people could find out about it. So this uh, office is meant to address that and to provide. Uh, just information on it. So that way, if people are thinking about self-directing, that they can get good information to uh, uh, make a decision as to that, whether that's something you wanna do. And if you are self-directing, you need some help, uh, some additional assistance, this office can assist with that. We've also updated our self-directed services and self-direction website at the division to help streamline that and make that a, uh, uh, you know, a better experience for individuals looking for information on the different fiscal, uh, fiscal management service models, uh, 
another word for fiscal intermediaries, um, supports brokerage, et cetera. So that way people can get you know, good information and be able to make decisions about that. We're also partnering with the uh, Community Living Education Project uh, to put together a, uh, a monthly conversation series on self-direction. Uh, the first of those uh, webinars uh, occurred earlier, uh, well, yeah, we're still in May, <laughs> uh, occurred earlier this month. Um, and the focus is on person-centered thinking and planning uh, for family members, individuals, professionals, uh, so people can share their experiences. Because uh, as uh, any family knows, uh, things can be, especially new things that haven't been, maybe a family hasn't or individual haven't done before, uh, having information about that helps ease anxiety about it. And families that have walked the walk, and I know a lot of you on, uh, I recognize a lot of names today of people uh, on the webinar, uh, people have done it and to help, you know, have a better forum for uh, a sharing of those experiences. So the upcoming webinars that the office will be doing in collaboration with the Community Living, Community Living Education Project or CLEP, uh, there will be one June 7th. Uh, and these topics are, you know, could adjust, but right now tentatively, uh, it'll be creating a circle of support as a foundation for self-direction. July's webinar will be on recruiting, hiring, and managing staff. August, everything you need to know about managing payroll and September using a collaborative map. Now, uh, Kyoko and uh, the Regional Family Support Planning Council will send out the uh, uh, slide deck uh, after the meeting, but you can click on any of the links in here uh, specifically for, for CLEP uh, to sign up for their email so you'll get alerts related to when registration is open for these upcoming exciting topics. Another piece I wanted to highlight is something that we're excited about and have been working on for some time. Uh, COVID derailed a lot of things, you know, on a lot of in a lot of places. Uh, but we're, you know, moving out of COVID and into an endemic stage, and we're really looking to get back on track. So in March of this year, we were able to launch our, our direct support professional competency and capacity building steering committee. Um, and this has to do with workforce development, as we all know, is very critical. Whether you're using a direct support professional or a self-directed employee, uh, having a competent workforce is, you know, very important and a cornerstone of the system. And this committee uh, will be charged with uh, reviewing and, and ultimately adopting a core set of competencies uh, based on nationally recognized competency uh, skill and skill sets. Uh, and really to help develop and, and overhaul our training framework. And that's everything from pre-service training, onboarding training, professional development, et cetera. Um, and ultimately, you know, where we really want to land is, and we've talked about this for years and, you know, uh, we've made different strides here and there, but really another step towards really creating a career path for direct support professionals. Uh, so that way, uh, you know, we have a stable workforce. So membership you know, has been finalized for this and we reached out and we have a, a broad stakeholder group that's meeting. Uh, this is co-chaired by the, uh, count, uh, the BOG Center and uh, uh, Kate Yankaitis from the Division of Developmental Disabilities. Uh, but membership includes, and this, it's over 20 members, um, but we make sure to include uh, individuals with disabilities, uh, family members of persons with disabilities, uh, our New Jersey Council on Developmental Disabilities, Autism New Jersey, Disability Rights New Jersey, uh, our Paul Aronson, our ombudsman uh, for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. We included an academic organization because we wanted to make sure we had that, um, that viewpoint as we were developing things. Uh, direct support professionals, service providers, and support coordination agencies. So we really wanted to make sure we had a broad base of stakeholders included in the group so that way we could move forward and uh, you know really make sure that we're creating the best and updating our trainings in the best way possible and really modernizing them. So now I want to talk about uh, wages in New Jersey. So first off um, as you're uh, you know I'm sure aware um, in 
uh, February 9th of 2019, uh, legislation was passed that will uh, incrementally increase the minimum wage in New Jersey, uh, culminating in a $15 an hour uh, minimum wage as of January 1st of 2024. So um, the last increase, uh, well, it was January 1st, and that we went to 13, January 1st of 2023 will be 14 an hour, and January 1st of 2024 will go to $15 an hour. So recognizing, you know, uh, that uh, it's important that obviously, keep, you know, we keep up at the division with minimum wage. We also recognize that to have a, uh, you know, a really competitive workforce and a stable workforce to just be in a minimum wage was not enough. And honestly, uh, you know, uh, the, the work that direct support professionals and self-directed employees do is very important. And I wish we could give, you know, uh, much, much more. And we're continuing to look at different things um, related to this, but we were uh, over the last uh, several fiscal years able to get approved and it is approved in the upcoming budget. Uh, an equivalent increase of about $1.25 an hour. So that way we're about 25% above minimum wage. And I'll talk more about you know, wages in a, in a moment, but um, uh, the impacted services are career planning, community inclusion, community-based supports, and the other uh, services you see, you see on your screen. It's any service funded by the division that has a direct support professional component. Now, in terms of overall wages, um, the state of New Jersey Division of Developmental Disabilities, we do participate in a, uh, uh, it's called a staff stability survey uh, through uh, the National Core Indicators. And uh, that's through NASDES as well. You could uh, Google uh, if you want uh, uh, New Jersey 2020 staff stability survey and it, it'll, it should bring you to the correct link. If not, uh, and anybody's interested, you know, uh, I can drop it in the chat once we're done. But that information showed that, in, and it's always a couple years behind the survey because it, it, it um, collects a full calendar year of wage data. So the 20, the information related to 2020 was just published uh, earlier this calendar year. And the 2021 data, uh, uh, data collection started in April of this year. And that'll close around June 30th. Now, all of our uh, agencies that uh, provide, you know, residential day supports, et cetera, are eligible to participate in that. And we certainly encourage them. We are uh, talking with um, the National Court Indicators Group as to whether or not they would have, uh, a, they could create a survey at some point in time around self-directed employees. Uh, they don't currently have that capability or that survey template, uh, but we did express as New Jersey, we would be very interested in helping pilot that and working through because we think that's very important information to have as well. But that staff stability survey from 2020 showed that at that point in time, our uh, wages were uh, on average, our average wage uh, was $15.36 an hour. Um, we were uh, the fifth highest state that year in terms of overall wages and uh, the highest state was Connecticut, only 60 cents higher. Um, now, I'm not saying that $15.36 is enough funding, uh, but I'm saying that's where we were. So when we look at and we layer on our $1.25 increases that we've done over the past uh, several fiscal years, we should be in the $17 range right now. That's what we would expect from the calendar year 2022 uh, survey whenever that, uh, you know, when that occurs uh, in a year or so. Um, but then we also have layered on additional wage increases January 1st of 23 and hopefully January 1st of 24. So we're hoping to at least be around or over $20 an hour by the time the minimum wage in New Jersey hits to 20, hit, hits uh, $15 an hour. But this is very important for, uh, uh, you know, for us to do and to make sure that we make sure we uh, do our work and uh, the grassroots effort that I know that uh, this group and others do to make sure um, that funding's al allocated for direct support professionals. So we're, we're uh, you know, gonna continue to work on this topic and I don't wanna give the impression that uh, we're done and that we should, you know, just rest because that's, uh, you know, we're, we're just, that's not the kind of people that we are. Uh, but I did wanna give you some information related to that. Another area that has come up over the, uh, uh, you know, uh, since I've uh, been in the position, uh, it relates to the support coordination rate. The original rate was $239.81 a month. Uh, 
and rightfully uh, uh, stakeholders such as yourselves and support coordination agencies uh, pointed out that when that rate was struck, it did not the the Bureau of Labor St Labor Statistics um, uh, job title they used did not have a four year degree. So we're very happy that on November first of twenty twenty one. We were able to increase the rate uh, to uh, by one hundred and twenty three dollars and eight cents. So now it's three hundred and sixty two dollars and eighty nine cents a month. So that's if I I think that's a sixty percent increase. Um, maybe it's less than sixty, but it's still a significant increase. But um, uh, that's another area we're happy. That was through the American Rescue Plan through enhanced FMAP dollars that we'll receive through. Uh, fiscal year 24. So we are making sure that um, the legislature, et cetera, knows that come fiscal year 24, uh, we are going to have to make sure that we are uh, allocating funds to make sure that that rate remains. But we are happy that we've been able to do that and put that decrease into effect. Okay, a few more slides, and then I have a couple other things, and then we can go to questions. Um, so uh, the next thing I want to go over in January of this past year, we uh, did release our updated uh, versions of our manuals. We have our, for our two waiver programs, we have our community care program and our supports program. So we uh, updated those manuals and, uh, you know, uh, through feedback over the years that we've gotten uh, from, you know, uh, the Family Advisory Council, DD Council, families, stakeholders, et cetera. So we're hoping that people really, uh, you know, see their uh, results of their advocacy uh, with some of the, with, with these areas. This is not an all inclusive list. Um, the manuals, page two of each manual has uh, what all the changes are. So, uh, you know, more in depth information is there. But I kind of picked out those elements that I thought, you know, really reflect uh, flexibilities, uh, you know, based on feedback from individuals, families, and other stakeholders. Uh, you know, so what, you know, in terms of how we can make the system adapt and, and work better. So the first, and this is something we work, work cl very closely with Gabrielle and others on the Family Advisory Council on, and that was uh, added our information about the short and long eligibility determinations, uh, not trying to go, you know, spend too much time on it just because we want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, the short application can be used if an individual has already had interaction with perform care or the children, you know, aka the children's system of care. Uh, generally, when that happens, uh, perform care and CSOC have uh, collected a lot of information that is needed for intake for Division of De Developmental Disability Services. So a person can, you know, if they have been interacted with uh, interacting with uh, CSOC and Perform Care, they can complete the short application, and then we can go to Perform Care and CSOC to see what to, to get information from them instead of having the family duplicate things. Um, updated all of the uh, individual budgets to reflect all the funding increases. Uh, this is something that we had a lot of advocacy on from families, remove the requirement that the NJ cap be completed every five years. Uh, the, it remains that the NJ cap can be updated whenever there's a change. So uh, it'll be discussed at least annually at the service plan meeting, but it can be updated annually if requested more, you know, more frequently if there's changes. So uh, it's just there was a requirement like, you know, if a person's stable and doing well, there had to be at least a reassessment every five years. And that was something that we heard from families that they found a bit disruptive. So we're able to adjust that. Uh, another piece that we uh, did, and this started with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but we in January uh, converted over to permanent policy, and that is removal of the restriction of parent, spouse, and guardian being able to be a self-directed employee for certain services. So they are able to be a self-directed employee outside of the pandemic. We added reference to legislation that occurred uh, recently that gives uh, ind uh, individuals with disabilities uh, a one-year extension of their special education entitlement. Um, we updated certification timelines for DAHAB, and this is something that uh, during Paul's uh, uh, Q&A section, session, somebody uh, asked a question about absentee factor, somebody going for, to, on vacation for, from day program. We did add a 5% absentee factor to the DAHAB rate. We always had a DAHAB, a, a absentee factor in the individual supports daily rate, um, but 
it, when the rates were struck and uh, implemented uh, pre 20, I guess it was around 2015, 2016, uh, a an absentee factor was not added to DAHAB. So we have corrected that. So there is now an absentee factor there. We added budget flexibilities around uh, certain areas like environmental mods, goods and services, vehicle mods. And that's that if there's not funding remaining in those areas and somebody needs to use money from a different uh, budget line item that they have, because right now in community care program, uh, you have the individual family supports budget, employment day budget, uh, and the residential line. So uh, uh, this allows money to be taken from other areas, it, it, you know, it, for other items in these areas. And we also clarified language around supports brokerage that, you know, they need to provide that service and not other services. And then this is my last slide, and then we'll move over to questions and answers. Um, so the other thing that we're excited that we added in, and this is going to be an evolution, and we welcome, uh, you know, input from, you know, individuals with disabilities, families, but really added more direct information to support the individual as a decision maker. Um, so it discusses how support coordination uh, agencies and service providers, you know, need to include individuals in problem solving and decision making, um, that we need to support information uh, individuals in the least restrictive way possible, and that there are uh, alternatives to guardianship. Uh, and that guardianship is an avenue of last resort. Now, again, we're not uh, making a judgment on those who have guardians. Uh, guardianship uh, is, uh, you know, uh, very effective and works for some people. But uh, in some cases, uh, through other things uh, like support decision making, uh, healthcare proxies, etc., there can be things done to help support the individual in decision making rather than going to guardianship. But guardianship will continue to be, you know, available to, you know, in the, you know, for any instance where that's appropriate. And it gives an overview of how the guardianship process works overall. So just a couple other things, and then I will uh, I will stop sharing my slide now and just say a couple more things and then we can go to QA. Okay. Um, so first off, uh, I want to, if you're not already signed up for updates from the Division of Developmental Disabilities, I really encourage you to do so. We can get something in the chat. It is on our website, but we send out DDD communications regularly, and that has really good information. In it. And we hold webinars monthly, and it has, you know, the information about how to register for our webinars. If there's any policy adjustments, we put it, we push it out through there as well as through webinars. And it's really just a great resource, I think. So uh, please sign up for DDD updates if you uh, if you're not already. Um, and I guess I, I could go on for another ten minutes or longer, honestly. But I think it, you know, in the interest of time, probably best to move over to questions and answers. So I thank you all very much for your time and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Is there anybody in the? Okay, we have some questions in the audience. Hello, uh, Jonathan. Thank you for coming. You are always very in informative and helpful. Uh, I have two questions. Number one, when I talk to the other families who has uh, support coordinators, not everybody is happy. I would say that 100% of the family member, other family members I talked to always feel that their support coordinators did not do an excellent job. We parents of a disabled uh, child always look for the excellent, excellency and the best. We don't wanna settle for secondary uh, uh, quality. So is there a way that, uh, I know there's a lot of competitions on the uh, uh, coordinate coordinator uh, coordination agencies across the state. But is there a way that we parents can review and rate, just, just like, a like a Google, Google rating, rating. Uh, uh, the, the services, services of their coordinator, coordinator and they don't have to, uh, and, and the parents, parents will not be held responsible, responsible if they make a true, truly honest comments or suggestions. And this information should be public to all parents who 
use uh, support coordinator. That's my, my number one question. And I have another question later. Thank you. Sure. Well, I can certainly, you know, speak to that. Like, I, I really appreciate that suggestion. And that's very interesting. Uh, we could certainly go back and, you know, uh, look at that and talk to support coordination agencies. Um, obviously, or, or maybe not obviously, but there would be, you know, when I, you know, an inf information technology you know, requirements there that we would have to look at. Um, but that's a, you know, a great idea in terms of long term you know, uh, you know, a longer term goal. So, but one thing I do want to say about support coordination in general is we, every support coordination agency has a mentor they have over at the division uh, that is there to help them. And uh, just like, uh, you know, for those of you that have, you know, received services from the state for a long time, uh, you know, there was a time when we had state case managers and we heard the same thing there. There were some state case managers that uh, there were, they, the families felt were stronger than others. And one of the benefits of move, moving to our the system we did, which honestly was a, was a requirement through the federal government as well, uh, the federal government requires choice in your care management agency. Uh, and when at a state case manager role, that was just very difficult to do. We didn't have unlimited you know, case workers. So by moving over to support coordination, um, you do have the ability to change support coordination agencies, and I'm not and I'm not saying you know you want to take that lightly because you build relationships, but you certainly have an ability to do that. Um, and if there is uh, you know an issue where a support coordinator isn't felt to be doing a great job or maybe needs some assistance, while they can be reaching out to their mentor at the division directly, uh, you could anonymously, if you wanted to, any family can. I'm, I don't want to make it a use statement. Any family can contact our fee for service help desk. Uh, and we'll route it correctly and just state X support coordination agency may need some help in you know, about Medicaid, uh, whatever it would be. And we can reach out and do technical assistance there. But again, I don't want to monopolize too much, but that's a great idea. And we will certainly go back and have a conversation about that. So thank you. All right. Um, we have one more question in the room. Could you just wait? Thank you very much, Jonathan. I uh, really appreciate that you meet with parents all the time with the webinars and everything else. Uh, going back to the support coordinator, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you were online uh, when I was talking to Paul before, I asked for some kind of mediator between uh, the powers that be and the families because sometimes they don't see eye to eye. That function should be actually the support coordinator, but mm -hmm. unfortunately it, it, it is hit or miss. I mean, we were blessed after the, you know, the, the support coordinator, the last one that we had, but we changed agencies three times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is very time consuming and it's, it's a pain. You know? Yeah, well, and uh, agree with you there. And I think one thing that we will never be done with, and if we ever say we are, I think there's there'll be a problem with that statement is training. Um, you know, we need to make sure even our support coordinators get the, the support they need to be able to do a good job. So. If a family is, like I said, finding that their support coordination isn't strong in mediation or whatever it would be, please reach out and we can certainly do that. Um, you know, give technical assistance. We also, because you know, every case is different. Sometimes uh, the mentor at the division needs to step in, and you know, sometimes we come to you know th those staff come to a meeting to help go through because some things are you know uh, you have to tread lightly, and we want to make sure that we're meeting everybody where they are. Uh, but thank you for that. All right. Um, there was a question in the chat um, about, is there any mechanism to ensure that the large increase that was given to the support coordinators actually get down to the support coordinators rather than going to overhead expenses? Well, the support coordination agencies, well, A, there was no legislation around that um, related to how much of that is a pass-through. Um, the argument from uh, legitimate argument. I don't want to sell argument like it was a negative thing. Uh, the rationale behind that was, you know, they have four-year degrees. And so we were able to put funding in there. Now, the uh, agencies, you need to look, look at that. I, like the, the, the other part of it is agencies may have been paying their staff at, well, I'm sure they were, uh, each support coordination agency possibly paying their staff at different, you know, different levels. So I don't know the specific, you know, uh, uh, funding areas of the agency, uh, et cetera. 
So there's no legislative language that says how much has to go through, but we do, ex you know, the expectation was that that come through. And if it's not, uh, you know, we could certainly bring that up at support coordination leadership. Um, we meet monthly with support coordination agencies and discuss that. Um, but uh, uh, there's no requirement as to how much would have to go through, you know, to the uh, support coordinator themselves. Okay, there's a question for um, uh, Molly. Uh, my local DDD approved respite program wants to extend its services to children, but the state told them that they cannot because the state is not accepting provider applications. Is that true? And if so, why? So there are two. So when the Children's System of Care um, contracts with all of the providers, with all of our providers, with the exception of intensive in community providers that enroll, um, they enroll in the Medicaid network. So where it's the sort of open access enrollment and um, there's not a contract with the state, we can accept those applications on a rolling basis. Similar to what I discussed with the RFQ earlier for intensive in-home clinical services, um, is the same as with respite services. In order for the state to enter into a contract with a provider agency, there are two pathways. One is that we issue a request for qualifications in which, and it's not competitive. It's basically any you know, eligible provider can apply and if they meet the requirements and standards, then we can uh, enroll them in our network. Then there are what we call our request for proposals where it's competitive and we invite applications from you know, a broad number of providers, but ultimately we're going to only be able to award, you know, as many, you know, so many beds or so many um, service slots. So we would, you know, when we open um, and reissue an RFQ request for qualifications for respite providers, any adult service providers would also be able to uh, respond to that opportunity. And so, you know, the last few years, as I think we all know, has been a little bit rough and rocky, um, particularly for our community and community respite providers. So we will be, um, we're looking at that now, and I anticipate that we will be um, reopening our respite provider network um, in, the, in the next several months. And at that point, your agency would be able to apply. And we would, it'd be great if we had more agencies that wanted to um, engage and we could expand that capacity. Thank you. Um, uh, another children's question, and then we have a few people with their hands up in the chat um, up on screen. Um, I'm just, wait, where was I? This person um, says it, it's, they've been dealing with a lot through the COVID. Um, it was nice to know that Perform Care always picks up the phone 24 seven. Uh, they were receiving MRSS services for a short time mm -hmm. until they got connected to a community therapist. Um, however, there are not that many mental health professional psychiatrists or developmental pediatricians available who do take Medicaid. Um, is there anything that CSOC is working on to increase the capacity of mental health professionals for children with IDD? That's the hundred million dollar question, because um, while we have challenges in our workforce that I think have become more apparent in the last several years, um, the, the lack of availability of, um, of neurodevelopmental ne neurologists, neurodevelopmental pediatricians, and child and adolescent psychiatrists, um, you know, in general, and in particular, those that may accept Medicaid, let alone private insurance. And so this is one of the areas in particular with, I think with physicians and with, with psychiatry where um, fewer and fewer of those specialists are even enrolling in, it's a struggle for the um, commercial insurance panels to also um, enroll those, those providers. Many of them have just walked away from you know, being impaneled or accepting those insurance payments. What we have done, and we, this is something we've been working on really over the last two years, is we've been working very closely with the Department of Human Services to increase the rate for the Medicaid rate for child and adolescent psychiatrists. And the, um, that rate increase was, is included in the governor's proposed budget, which will 
hopefully be passed by the legislature on or before June 30th of this year. So coming close to that deadline. And when, and then they'll probably take a little bit of time to get that schedule in place. And so we are really, and we, we typically, typically one department doesn't like advocate for another department's budget, but this is a kind of a unique situation because we know that although we don't have management and oversight of those, um, of that network of professionals, their availability is absolutely critical um, for, uh, for, our, for our youth and families. And so um, we're optimistic that that will um, increase and attract more providers into the network. Um, but we do know, and I, know I don't wanna take up more time on this, but the workforce challenges that are facing our industry are, um, are, are formidable at this point. Thank you. Um, yeah. This question seems to be uh, directed towards the adult services. Uh, New Jersey's public transit system has been inconsistent bus line services in certain regions. Will virtual options still be in place for people with disabilities who continue to face transportation, transportation barriers or have significant medical conditions? So are virtual work options still going to be available? available. Uh, sure. Thank you for the question. Do appreciate that. Uh, I do want to separate out just two things like employment, like work options. Uh, that can mean to some people competitive employment and whether or not that remote work is allowed there, et cetera. But in that context, and I guess it's kind of obvious, but I just want to state that's really the employer. Like if somebody happens to have a, a, a job where they can work remotely, you know, that wouldn't be something the division was uh, involved with. Uh, in terms of decision making. Uh, in terms of virtual options uh, still being available post pandemic, we are, uh, you know, continue to look at and it's a very serious and it looks positive around virtual goods and services. And I want to just define what that means, though, because, it, uh, you know, in my world, in my mind, it may mean something different. But to me, that's like the, uh, in, the way we're looking at that is, that is uh, the virtual college class, the virtual tutoring class, etc. Uh, those, uh, we feel that we can make an adjustment with a uh, minimal, uh, you know, um, minimal lift in terms of, uh, uh, you know, any adjustments to waiver programs uh, that we'd have to interact with the federal government on. Uh, so uh, that we, we feel that we'll be able to land. Um, now, will that be 40 hours a week, and I use that as a, you know, kind of a typical work week, we probably will have some, res some restriction on that, like probably a couple days a week max, just because uh, we're, what we're trying to strike a balance is the federal government funds us through our 1115 comprehensive Medicaid waiver for home and community-based services. So we need, to we need to strike a balance there. I think there is a very legitimate argument that people without disabilities uh, engage in virtual activities, so therefore people with disabilities should be able to as well. Um, but we do have a strike, a strike a balance related to whether or not allowing, you know, uh, waiver dollars to be used for 100% virtual, uh, you know, programming really is integrating them into the community in the way the federal government would, you know, expects. So now in terms of like virtual waiver services, and what I mean by that is like virtual dehabilitation, that uh, we're, is going to be very challenging to maintain post pandemic. Uh, but virtual, uh, uh, which I think most of it is around, um, or a lot of it is around virtual goods and services, gain you, et cetera. I'm not seeing challenges uh, in that regard, but we'll get more information out about that as soon as we have something ready for, uh, for print. Thank you. The, um, if we don't get to your questions, you can always put in the chat or email the Family Support Planning Council, and we will make sure that your questions get to Molly, Jonathan, or Paul. Um, Todd Cooper, you have your hand up. Thank you. And before I ask my question, thanks for sacrificing your Saturday morning so that we could actually come. Um, really good, thank you. Um, and my question's a little bit of a hard one. I don't mean to, to go to a bad spot, but we recently had to file a TPMU complaint um, at the request of one of your colleagues. And we got responses back from the PPMU office almost immediately that they've received information. But when I asked to know who was assigned to the case, I didn't get a response. Okay. And I'm just wondering what the PPMU, it, it, and that may be appropriate, right? I don't know. I've never done this before. I'm sorry that I'm even here. Um, but I'd like to know what the PPMU process looks like, 
how long it takes and what type of feedback the family would get or what type of input the family is allowed to have, specifically the individual with disabilities um, having their opportunity to share their story verbally because they can't write it for themselves. Certainly. So I want to start by uh, Kayoko if, or somebody from the council. If you could drop my email address into the chat, that would be wonderful, just because this sounds like it, it, you know, it probably needs an individual conversation, but high level. Um, so in other words, email me and I will, you know, make sure we, we kind of dig in. Um, okay. But uh, high level, you know, we have several layers of, uh, you know, uh, review, regulation, certification, licensing over uh, with state programs. Um, if the issue, if the uh, presenting challenge is around um, licensed residential programs, uh, PPMU can be the conduit, but we would likely uh, you know, engage the Office of Licensing as well, because they have licensing authority there. If it's around a day program, licensing does not regulate day programs, provider performance and monitoring does, they do the certification, depending on what it the could question be home. Okay, group home. Okay, sorry. So it yeah. could be that they're working in collaboration with licensing. It was asked, they asked licensing, I'd really have to get into the specifics. Um, but high level, uh, if it's day services, provider performance and monitoring unit would follow through, and it really depends on the, the, the specific circumstance. If some things require provider performance and monitoring unit to go in and pull paperwork and do a review, um, then that may take a little more time because they need to see whether meds were administered, whether notes were taken. And I just saw in the chat, I do apologize for my acronym soup. Uh, PPMU stands for Provider Performance and Monitoring Unit. That is a unit over at the Division of Developmental Disabilities within DDD, not OP, not the Office of Program and Integrity and Accountability, which is where licensing sits. So I think we should dig in outside of this because uh, I, I want to make sure that you get a good uh, satisfactory answer, but that's the high level response for the group. No, thank you. And if you're willing to be engaged personally, that would would, I couldn't ask for anything more than that. Sure, Thank sure. you very much. Email me over and I'll talk to the staff and we'll see the best way to approach. We'll do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Felt like I was in the disco for a second there. Um, Lisa Weisbeck, your hand your has hand been up. Been yes. Hi, Jonathan. Um, I have a question that, is, that uh, many of the families in our region are asking. So my question is regarding the $25 cap for self-directing families. Um, families, especially with more involved loved ones, those who are severely behaviorally or medically involved, um, who, have, who, who require um, uh, translation services because of uh, hearing impairments, are unable to find qualified staff that are willing to work for $25 an hour. These families really need specialized care, whether it's someone with a high level of um, expertise in medical issues or, or controlling behaviors. Um, many agencies won't accept them. So really many families often only have the, the quote unquote choice of keeping their loved ones at home. Um, if the families were accessing services through an agency, the agency would be able to charge DDD up to more than twice as much for those individuals. And I'm speaking of individuals who have a D or an E um, tier, uh, mostly with liquidity. So families are really um, asking why they are not given the same access to their, their loved one's budget as an agency would. Certainly, and I'm happy to answer that. And I do recognize that, you know, uh, there may just be some, some instances where, you know, we're going to have, we're not going to be, you know, I'm not going to be able to get where people want to get. But the really what this comes down to, in my view, and I know that some will disagree, is it comes to the wage that the employee themselves gets. Okay. Right now in New Jersey, we're projecting uh, direct support professional wage is about $17 an hour, somewhere around that right now. Could be more with some agencies, could be less with some agencies. And the self-directed employees, we have a reasonable and customary being minimum wage up to 25. We do have the ability for uh, in, for a, a move for monies in excess of 25 uh, in certain circumstances, but overall it's that. 
Now, if you know, moving over to a system where self-directed employees who have, uh, you know, essentially this the you know uh, comparable skill sets and education to people to direct support professionals, and being in a situation where a a direct support professional uh, who staffs you know uh, provides uh, services for about eight thousand people in group homes and you know pre-pandemic about eleven thousand people in um, uh, day programs. Um, if you work for an agency and can only get 17 an hour, but you could work for a family and get 53 an hour, 33 an hour, there's an overall inequity there. And I'm looking for really with the workforce. So my thing is if there is a, uh, and I don't disagree with the feeling, pay everybody $40 an hour, everybody $50 an hour, um, but it should be everybody, self-directed employee or a direct support professional. Uh, it shouldn't matter because the family happens to be the employer in this instance, and this and for this person that doesn't have a family who can self-direct, those staff don't get that kind of wage. So to me, it's about parity and really, you know, keeping the system uh, in a place where it's it's equitable to everyone. And I recognize pe different people's uh, feeling on equity is going to be different, and I take nothing away from that. In my role as assistant commissioner, we are looking to serve a system of about 25,000 people of all different needs. And I'm really looking for, um, you know, to just be as fair and equitable, whether you're self-directing or not. And an argument can be made self-directing uh, individuals already get higher wages than direct support professionals. So it's just a, a difficult thing to really land on. But that is, you know, good, bad, and different. That is the rationale. Okay, thank you so much. Do we have time for two more questions? Okay. Um, Leah, did, did she see you? Uh, yes. Um, so I was just wondering, um, I had a question with the DDD application. You were saying something about you could do the short application if it's, if combination with the perform care and this the what is it called something system of care i forgot what this first c stands for there's the children's system of care which molly oversees that particular right, 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 right. okay so the issue i have is um unfortunately um i i've i've only dealt with my daughter with perform care not not the other so i don't know if that's why when i was talking to a ddd worker why they couldn't find her name in the system so does that mean because I'm not involved, involved with them that before we do the DD application and it's going to want to have it's still having to be the long application and we can't do the short application or what can I do to so I can do the short application not the long because that long application is very especially yeah. someone like me with brain fog and everything that's that's a lot it is a lot it's like 30 something pages I think or something and I just I'm trying to avoid that if possible. So can I can I speak to that so I just want to explain again because I think a lot of so a lot of folks are it's often, I don't wanna say confused, but we often kind of interchangeably talk about the children's system of care and perform care. So okay. the children's system of care really means two things. One, it's the group of staff that work for the state, my team at the, you know, at the Department of Children and Families who oversee the entire system of care, but it also is used to describe the entire si contracted system of, of treatment providers, other service providers, as well as perform care. Perform care um, is contracted with the state of New Jersey to um, as our contracted services administrator. And what that means is that we contract with them as a private entity to manage a lot of our administrative processes. Quite frankly, often private entities are more agile than government. And so that was part of what informed that decision to move things to perform care. They can do some things a lot more exp expediently and quickly than, than we're able to. We serve the CSOC and perform care have a number of different um, resources and services for families um, of children with IDD needs. And depending on what your child needs, you're gonna interact with different um, people at Perform Care, as well as with our providers in the community. So we have many, many families. And whenever I talk about the children's system of care with folks that are not that close to it, I really try to emphasize that we have many families who will come to um, the children's system of care 
And the only thing that they're seeking is that eligibility determination. So, you know, we have about 16,000 children right now who have eligibility, IDD eligibility that was established through the process that is in um, regulation for children. And so those, so the application process is facilitated through Perform Care, but under the um, auspices of the state. So some families are only receiving that determination. Other families may be um, seeking eligibility as well as the array of family support services that are accessible through CSOC only for children who have that eligibility. And then there are some other children who may be receiving, who may have eligibility. They may be receiving family support services. They may be receiving other behavioral health services, including care management organization, those intensive in-home treatment services. So the, the array is in some ways, it's a little broader, but it's a little bit more complex. So if you are, if a, so actually this is one of the things that we're looking at right now is that we know for our families that are enrolled with care management organization, which is a relatively small number of children who have um, eligibility, they don't necessarily, they don't have the support in the community that say a family enrolled with CMO has in navigating that process. So we're looking at what other supports we can provide um, for families who are trying to manage that uh, you know, youth to adult transition without the support of care management organization. Um, in the, what you can do um, is, and this is, I, you know, I gave you guys both the Perform Care website and the CSOC address. That's a question that I would ask you to submit if you want to, um, if you're not involved with CMO, I would oh, ask you to- I don't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. That's why I forgot to mention. I'm sorry. She's gonna. She's actually gonna. She's gonna be 20 this month, and she has a CMO. Oh, she actually has well, a CMO. Well, then, the, then the care manager, your CMO, should be assisting. However, you may also need or want either your care manager, or you may want to reach out to that CSOC director's inbox because we keep. Um, you know, we we have often what, what you need is the file. <laughs> like that's what you need is the file, and we maintain we are the custodian of all of those records. So if you okay. reach out through that email, we will immediately get that over to the staff person who um, who is responsible for ensuring that we're able to provide that information. So then this way, by doing that, I should be able to do the short application. I don't have to do the long one. Yeah, hopefully it will depend on, you know, how, like, how long ago she established eligibility, what's in the file, you know, it depends on, you know. What oh, you mean the, for CMO? For CMO or for porn care? No, okay. no, no. For when she, when, when she established IDD eligibility through as a child. Oh, wow. Well, uh, she was, yeah. she was 17, 17. Oh, okay. Sorry. So it's relatively recent. There's yeah. a good, it's, it's more likely than not that what you're going to need is there. Yeah. Sometimes what we see, like yeah. children who establish what? eligibility. She might have been 16. I'm sorry, she might have been 16. I, I think the remember. challenge is if, if somebody came through Perform Care uh, CSOC when they were, you know, six, seven, eight yeah. plus years ago, uh, for DD eligibility, some of that paperwork may be yeah. dated and have to be redone. But in okay. any case, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, we do try to make it as flexible as possible and utilize what we have. Mm -hmm. So okay. I can let you know, I, I recognize it's a, uh, uh, part of the challenge is because everyone's an individual and every case is unique, it's difficult to say this particular process for eligibility will work for everyone. Right. Because some people may have a lot of documentation and attended special education, and some people may not have. Some people may have come from other yeah. states. So, right. uh, but we're just going to work very hard to make sure that we recognize this is hard. And we know that families, you don't get a day off. Uh, so we're we're here to make this as easy as as easy as we can. I recognize it doesn't feel that way all the time, but you know Molly and I are that is our goal within our systems to make sure that this works as best as we can have it for all. Of you. So, all right, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So I want to thank everybody who's online and who came in person. I want to thank Jonathan, Molly, Paul Aronson, and Christine Becker for coming here today. Um, and sharing their Saturday morning with us. Uh, for council members, we're gonna be returning at one o'clock for our afternoon session. Uh, so thank you again. If we didn't get to your question, um, Jonathan's emails in, in the chat, our emails in the chat, you can always contact us and we'll get your questions to where they're supposed to go. Thank you so much all for joining us today.
Yeah. Thank you all Thank and great you. job to everybody. This was really yeah. well done. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us. Have a good day. Bye-bye.